can be. So um, I, I'm going to start with the story of this 10-year-old girl that I saw recently, maybe about three months ago. Her name's Charlotte. Um, that's not her real name, obviously. But her name's Charlotte. And uh, her parents and her lived in Guelph. And, uh, you know, the parents came uh, seeking the service because they were really uh, struggling a lot, like, with her behavioral outbursts at home. And they were telling me, like, you know, Dr. Nick, like, the outbursts have, like, really increased in severity and frequency, like, the last two or three months. Uh, they're not happening as much at school. Um, and, and then the other thing is they had some concerns because she had some kind of, like, perfectionistic tendencies and, like, wanting to do activities a certain way or needing to have things done right. And then, you know, she had some relative difficulties with her reading that they noted over the years. They describe her as like a really social, bright kid, like very articulate. Um, they're a very warm and loving family. They're like very nurturing parents, very invested in their child, which is always like a real pleasure for me to see. Um, and there was no, you know, she didn't have any significant history of any kind of traumas. There was no, you know, significant medical history or other kind of other factors that I sometimes have to think about. And so when she came in for the assessment with me, like the actual standardized testing, you know, her presentation was fairly consistent with what her parents described. Like she was this really cute, um, verbally articulate, bubbly little girl, very engaged in the testing process, like very compliant with the things I needed her to do. Uh, she could get a little bent out of shape when we were doing an activity and she thought she should be able to get it, but she wasn't quite getting it. Like it bent her out of shape a little bit. She needed a little pep talk at those times. And she definitely had some difficulties uh, putting sounds to letters and then blending the sounds, right? So, you know, the results of the assessment actually showed that she actually had dyslexia, which is, I don't know how many people are familiar with dyslexia, but that's the most common form of reading disability. Um, and really, most people with dyslexia, the core problem is they cannot map letter forms to the sounds and then blend the sounds to read the words. So contrary to popular belief, <laughs> dyslexia literally just means you cannot identify sight words. That's all it means. It doesn't mean you see things backwards or you reverse things. None of those are diagnostic of dyslexia. It literally means you can't identify sight words and some people with dyslexia have those other issues. So she definitely had dyslexia and you know, she wasn't really getting the kind of help she needed with her reading in school or even outside of school. And because of her kind of temperament, which was like needing to get things or needing to do things while wanting to appease people, that was driving up her frustration. And so these meltdowns were like bad and they were happening in the hours after school. And so, you know, I was able to work with her parents to kind of fashion like a better learning plan for her in school, but also fashion some extra reading support outside of school. And over, like they actually kept in touch with me, which is why I like this story. So over the next three months, they kind of like noticed like a drop in these kind of episodes. They were much more manageable at home um, and the family was just doing better, right? So I thought that was just like a really compelling story to me. The parents actually still email me once in a while, which I always love, I always love to know like how kids are doing. So. Um, so that's, you know, that's one story that sprung to mind that I thought it's, it's a really good example of why this service is so critical. It's not just to identify learning issues, but it's to identify other problems that might evolve because of that within the family unit or within the environment. The second story I have for you is probably just as good. Um, and this is, so I work at Grand River Hospital during the day. And in my spare time, I have this other thing going on. So at Grand River Hospital, sometimes we get referrals from uh, a program called the Young Adult Program. And the Young Adult Program is, how many people know what a Section 23 classroom is? Okay, so a Section 23 classroom is a classroom mandated by the government for youth who are struggling in a regular school program. And usually those youth have some kind of uh, emotional difficulty or other mental health problem that's causing them difficulties getting to school or causing them difficulty making credits, like getting high school credits. So if there's a pattern that evolved in high school and a youth is like not getting credits, they're not agreeing what they need, sometimes the school will suggest that they go to a section 23 classroom. There's, those are specific assigned classrooms. A lot of them are housed within hospitals. So we at Grand River have a section 23 classroom that's staffed by teach, two teachers from the school board. 
So kids that go there have mental health issues, they may have learning issues too, they get more individualized attention and support from the teachers and they get mental health support as well. And then once they make up some credits, they usually get reintegrated back into their school program. So the Young Adult Program is the Section 23 program. And uh, the youth I saw, his name was Thomas, and he's 16. And like he had pretty much struggled with school when you started looking at his report cards most of his life. And um, you know his struggles with school kind of resulted in this pattern where you could see starting in grade nine, he just stopped going to school. And then when he would go to school, there was just a lot of non-compliance. There was a lot of like aggression. There was a lot of, you know, he was starting to use like cannabis at some low level. Um, and then along the way also, he had been diagnosed with depression and anxiety by other mental health providers. Uh, but the medications that he was on for depression and anxiety weren't really helping as, as much as, you know, the doses would suggest. They were less helpful than what you think. Um, he lived with his mom, who was, I, again, this is an unusual story because she was just this wonderful, invested parent, really, um, really concerned about his welfare and his progress. And he was actually referred to me by a teacher at the Young Adult Program because the teacher noticed in the one-to-one -one work with him that, you know, he's having a hard time, like, understanding concepts. I teach him a concept today. He doesn't seem to retain it over time. And so she's like, what's going on? She actually took the time to look through his school record and be like, oh, this kid like struggled like the whole way through. It's like, like grade two, right? It's not a new thing. So she's like, I think something's going on. So I, you know, we pursued this assessment. And again, he came in, I think like really frustrated with his experience in life in general. And so he came in very invested in being there and wanting to know what's going on. And really the, the results of the assessment suggest that he actually has a delay in his thinking. So most people's intelligence, when we talk, when I say intelligence, I'll just use IQ. That's what people are familiar with. Oh, my IQ is this and that. People are running around cocktail parties talking about how their IQ is so whatever it is, 134 or whatever, right? So most people's IQs are between like 90 and 110. That's like the average range. Uh, IQ scores between 80 and 90 are kind of low average. They're not usually going to show up as problems in your day-to-day -day life. IQ scores between 70 and 80 will show up as kind of my problems for you. And scores below 70, you're going to have some real issues. The learning, retention, a consolidating concept. So his IQ was a 65. And, you know, he was 16. And all of these mental health diagnoses that have been put on this kid, yeah, the meds were not as helpful. Why weren't the meds as helpful? Because if you were going to a place where you were frustrated every day with stuff that you couldn't even do, yeah, you're going to be angry. And are you going to be depressed? Yeah, you're going to be depressed. And is Zoloft going to help you as much as it could? Probably not. So, you know, like luckily he had this done at the end of the day, and we were able to at least come up with a school plan that would modify his curriculum to lower demands when he reintegrated to his high school. And it kind of took the edge off some of these other problems. I mean, he still had a lot of issues, but it took the edge off for sure. And it's just sad to me that it was done that late for him. And the reason I'm telling you that story is because I have a colleague who works on the adult inpatient mental health unit. So these are adults who are in there with severe mental illness. 50% of her caseload is identifying intellectual disabilities that have been missed by our system. That is depressing as hell to me. So that's, to me, it's like, I know mental health is just an underserved area in general, but I think both of these stories highlight not only why psychoed assessment can be helpful in identifying traditional learning issues or like ADHD or things like that, but it can, it can be helpful in identifying why someone's like not responding to medication, for example, why someone is having other mental health issues like outbursts or meltdowns or whatever it is. So I think it's like a super powerful tool. Um, and that's kind of the end of the stories, but I thought it. Okay, do I have a couple more minutes? I don't know what you do. Okay, so I thought I'd take just a few minutes and explain what a psychoed assessment is, because people are like, how many people know what it is? No. Oh, okay. So why don't you describe it <laughs> Well, it's a series of, ten we did it with our 10-year-old daughter, okay. actually. Okay. We, so the first story you told, it almost described exactly. Oh, wow. 10-year-old that we noticed during COVID. Yeah. Um, Again, out of character outbursts, right. and we right. determined it was she couldn't handle the, you know, Demands. whatever, like yeah. having a shower at night instead of in the morning. Right. We couldn't understand that. Right. And uh, 
it was the same sort of thing that they determined it's the sight words. It wasn't dyslexia, but because okay. that's what I kind of wondered yeah. with certain things. But she fell the three years of COVID. She basically fell yeah. back to the level yeah. of grade. She's a grade five now, so she was still at essentially grade three for those. Um, you know, if, if the word was uh, enter the room, E N T R instead of yeah. E R, certain things like right, that. Right, right, right. And then um, the what do you call it? Uh, Holding a pencil, uh, yeah, motor skills, yeah, skills were down for okay. what they had should have been. Through. Yeah. So yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, so you described his experience. So really, what it is, it's like think of me as like a I'm a private investigator, and so because a lot of the conditions I assess, I don't just assess learning. I have like expertise in autism, so I assess a lot of that. But these are not conditions where we have any biomarkers. I do not have a blood test or a brain scan or something acutely reliable. So what I have to rely on is gathering a large volume of information from multiple environments, multiple sources, and multiple time points, looking at the information concurrently at the same time. And, and what I'm really doing is I'm piecing together what is the most likely hypothesis. So that's kind of what I'm doing when I'm sitting down with these thoughts. What's the most likely scenario here? I will never, ever be able to confirm anything I'm saying. That's the beauty of my job. I can never jump in someone's brain and go like, yeah, frontal support, though, was ADHD. I can't, there's no way for me to know. The only way for me to know is by external behavior, right? So I know the people are like, oh, like, so really all I'm getting paid for is an educated opinion. I don't really know anything. So you <laughs> just one notch above the weatherman. Yeah. <laughs> I have some accountability because I can tell you parents, parents are, well, parents are like, <laughs> something is off how do you get from that to you like how, where is how did they find you and is it covered and i mean you know so i'm that. laughing because the system is so broken yeah. so I'll, I'll tell you a little story about that so that clinic i started in cleveland ohio i was passionate about that work because that cle clinic is an inner city clinic in the public sector i wrote a federal grant to get what we needed to start that clinic because it was under there was no service there there was no autism assessment so I'm like, why don't we have a clinic? So my boss says, why don't you start a clinic? And I'm looking at her like, this was after my fellowship. Like I felt like I knew nothing, right? And I'm like, start a clinic? What are you talking about? Like are you, you lost your mind? So I did everything, right? Wrote the grant, built the people. So I, that was awesome because it was in the public sector, people didn't have to pay. In Ontario, psychologists are very pigeonholed. They do not have the latitude they have in the States. So what ends up happening here is if you're working in a public sector and a service and you're stuck in that service, Right, and that's what you do. You know, like if you're at um, Sick Kids or something, you have an academic appointment, so you can write grants and stuff. But outside of that, not really. So I was actually approached to start this multi this clinic, and I said, "This is my shot because I love building stuff, but I'm going to have to do it in the private sector. Not my first choice because people have to pay, obviously, right? But it's not covered by OPE. Psychologists are not covered by OPE. So I do realize that there is." You know, disparities in mental health are everywhere, and this is a big area of disparity because I can tell you the level of need is at the ceiling here, and the level that the school boards are providing are at the floor, right? So let me just give you one example. Sorry, you got me started on something. Oh, I'm burning hey. oh, okay. <laughs> So it's like, well, I'll give you one example. So the base rate of like dyslexia, which I was mentioning is the most common reading disability, is about 7%. So seven out of 100 kids are on average gonna have dyslexia. In a K through eight school, they approve five psycho ed assessments for like a medium range, low need school for the year. So that five psycho ed assessments for the whole school is not even meeting the base rate of one type of learning disability. And that's only one thing. So imagine how many kids are just falling by the wayside. To answer your question, how do people get to me? The system's broken. So they either will hear it from a teacher or they'll go online, they're Googling, or they're, it's not well-structured. It's not like there's some great format where it's like, if you're having problems with your child, like go through these steps and this is, no, it's not like that. It's Would your doctor it's say, we recommend doing yeah. this? So yeah, okay. yeah, the doctor would, so the most common routes are the teacher who will say like, yeah, maybe you should consider this, the family doctor. Um, and in the families that do have pediatricians and psychiatrists already, they may recommend it. And then a lot of families just seek it out on Google, right? I've actually, this is another, this is a true story. I've heard, I had one case where, 
Not gonna say stuff, but it's, I don't know what to say about this. So I had this eight-year-old kid who has classic high-functioning autism. There's no doubt in my mind, outside of the brain scan, I don't even need the brain scan. Like he has classic high brain. So that family had struggled for like six or seven years because the pediatrician kept telling them he's not autistic because he can talk and he doesn't rock in the corner. I mean, this was a general pediatrician, but I was just like, what are you talking about? So like, it just, it's a, it, it's a, it's a very disconnected system. Is the Ministry of Health aware how severe this is and are they approachable for recommendation from people like you? So the only reason I stay at Grand River Hospital, the only reason is because I work on a preschool diagnostic team. So I work, I actually spend most of my days with three to seven year olds, so cute. But anyways, <laughs> so that program is funded by the Ministry of Health. And um, the reason I stay there is because none of those families would ever, ever be able to access like a developmental assessment or anything like that. And we actually just pushed the Ministry of Health to expand our mandate to age eight because school board psychologists, they do not see kids under the age of eight because no one wants to work with little kids. It's a lot of behavioral management. It's a lot of like, you know, like <laughs> using reinforcers and things like that, being on the floor, crawling around. I don't usually wear dress pants. So, um, but, uh, so it's like, so we just push them to extend to age eight, but they're not going to pay us a dime more. We with just that, said with that, that extension that would include Doug Ford now. So I can tell you that this line of work that money. this line of work that I'm in, it's no different than any other area of mental health right now. So massively underserved. And to me, it's a combination of two things. The first one is underfunding in the public system, like in the education system. The second one it's like a professional problem because the college of psychologists, they're not, they don't generate enough graduates to do this kind of work. Like there's not enough psychologists, right? There's just not enough anywhere close. So there's like a huge gap, right? And I don't know, I don't really know what the fast answer to that problem is. Yeah, it's very frustrating to me actually. Um, just curious, there is definitely a shortage of like, not just psychologists, but counselors in general. I have this, Like because of my area, which is autism, I have expertise in that. So I'm known for assessing that. So I, the bulk of my practice is assessment, but then there's psychologists where the bulk of their practice is therapy, right? So if you're looking for a counselor in general, let's say a family therapist, mm -hmm. I would first look at like what their credentials are. Are they like a regulated healthcare provider? Are they like a so registered social worker? Are they a registered psychotherapist? Are they a registered psychologist? Because then at least they have some kind of base knowledge and credentials. And I would say therapy, looking for a good therapist is different from looking for a good assessor because therapy is kind of this meld between science and art. And a lot of therapy outcomes, up to 40% of therapeutic outcome, believe it or not, has nothing to do with the skill of the therapist. It's just the relation, relational uh, fit between the therapist and the client, right? Absolutely. So, I just see this. Yeah. And that's the problem because one of the problems is just how do you know it's a good fit? Let's say, well, you have to do 10 meetings. Well, 10 meetings is about like a couple thousand dollars yeah. to find out, oh, it's a bad fit. So I don't think you have to do, so is this for a child or an adult? Or for anyone. Oh, anyone. Okay, it's a little different for children. Because children take a little, like I do a lot of child therapy, children take a little while to, you know, they're not going to really share with you unless their walls are down a little bit. So um, especially teenage boys, teenage boys might take about seven sessions just to like get, you know, get it rolling. Yeah. You want to meet them on a basketball court, not in an office, all right? But, uh, but I would say, you know, if you spend two or three sessions, and then you check in with that person to see like how it's going. Most times I can tell my, the fit I have with someone in two or three, I don't need 10 sessions to know what the fit, like. 
I mean, if, if I'm not just trying to make money, but it's like, roughly like, eh, you know, like I could refer you to this person. Sometimes the client has a reference, right? Because I have a lot of teenage boys that come. So I got a lot of boy clients because it's hard to find male therapists. Like the bulk of the people in my profession are female, 90%. So it's hard to find male psychologists, right? No, no, no guy wants to work with little kids and call them. <laughs> but really, only I like playing with bubble guns. Okay. Did you see an increase during COVID of referrals? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I don't even know what to tell you. Like, I don't have any easy answers up here. It's like bursting at the scene. So when we started, you know, at Comedate, we started in the middle of the pandemic in May 2021. And initially when I started, I'm like, okay, this is good. We're gonna get some learning disability, child referrals and this and that. So uh, right out of the gate, we got all these adults that wanted like ADHD ruled out. I'm like, where are all the kids with learning disability? It's like, we're okay. you never know what you're gonna get when you open a business, right? But it's like, it's like exploded through the roof. Like it's gone in a way, like I never planned for it to go this way. Like I never said like, hey, let's have four clinics. But now we have four clinics. It's like we see, people across the lifespan, because people come to me for autism, I see autism assessment from like three years old up to like 50. And lately I've been getting all the adult females with ASD because their presentation is very different than males. And so you really have to know autism to be able to pick that apart. What's ASD? Autism spectrum disorder. Yeah, so um, yeah, so it, 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 I think in every area of mental health, it's just a massive explosion, right? But the converse to that, because we did see the spiking in mental health during the pandemic in the three years. Are we seeing a leveling and it coming down? Because I, I even find there's, we are, people are a lot more calmer now. They're out there being more and more social. So are you seeing any of that calming effect there? So I'm not seeing personally, like I don't have a, a I haven't read any articles that give me a macro, yeah. a macro view on it. But all the colleagues that I talk to, like the people that I all work in the field, everyone's worked to the phone. So I'm not really seeing it on the ground. Like I'm just seeing, what I'm seeing is that as a society, we're just more and more aware of mental health problems, which is good on the one hand, but on the other hand, there's like this gap in services. So if you're aware that something's going on with you, it's like your question, where do I go? Like where do I go to get service? And then everyone I know who's in my profession, they have like a two year wait list. And those are for people paying. So you're paying all this money, you're waiting two years on someone's wait list? It's crazy. Like, I never would have ever expected that it would be like this. It's a, and the number of autism assessments I get, referrals, it's like, oh my God, I could spend 150% of my time just doing that. So what you're saying is that you're still dealing with the backlog here. Yeah. And you, you don't, you're not, there's no data. Yeah. Well, I can tell you just, I did write an article in the middle of the pandemic about my perspectives of the pandemic's effect on mental health as a psychologist in the public sector. I think it's published in a trauma journal, actually. But uh, I had done some literature review on, like, they had had, like, the massive earthquakes in Christchurch. Uh, years ago, yeah. and they did some like macro data, and they found that the mental health needs it kind of bubbles up, and then it goes down a bit, and then the need really spikes in about uh, nine to like twenty four months after the crisis. So there's like a delayed effect, in other words. So I don't know if we're in that. I don't know where we are in that. Probably in the delayed phase, but I think because of the awareness of mental health, and I, I don't really see the need going down at all on any level. I can tell you, I don't think going down. I don't know. Like, I think it's going to just go up, actually. Yeah. What can the average normal person sitting in this room do to help improve this problem? I think writing letters to officials or writing summary statements, emails about like, hey, how come like we don't have, in fact, there's that ad I just heard on the radio about how children in schools are not getting enough mental health supports because of the government. So I think just being an advocate uh, to your local, to ministers in your jurisdiction, things like that is powerful. Um, and then I think at a more local level, if you're in a position in your life where you have time to go volunteer in schools, so schools were doing a program called Strong Start. Did you guys are, yeah, the reading. Still going on. Yeah, so they just started again. Yeah. So Strong Start is a volunteer parent driven program for early reading intervention for kids in kindergarten. So you would go in and you get some coaching and you deliver some reading intervention for kids. 
So think initiatives like that are really great. And I actually think that could be done at a club level. I don't know any clubs that I think it's a great idea, right? Volunteering as a club to do strong start on a rotation. It's a good idea. Is it? I have lots of good ideas. What's your average um, span for assessments? Like, how long does it take you from start to finish with? I mean, I'm sure it's different for every kid, but on average. So I'm very, very proud of this. So when we started this clinic, the two goals were quality and efficiency. And so I can tell you, like, from the time I'm done actually doing the testing with the one-to-one -one testing with a person, um, our turnaround time is four to six weeks mm -hmm. to the end. Most turnaround times are about six months. So we get it done in four to six weeks. And all the providers in this clinic, we turn around in four to six weeks. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So um, any other questions? I don't know. I could talk all day about this topic. But. You mentioned uh, the increase in, in adult um, visits for autism assessment. Huge. Um, yeah, that's 50% of the autism assessments to get now adults to do over. So yeah. obviously that, that is in part fueled by um, just awareness as you said but is this awareness um, reaching levels where people are grasping and and thinking well maybe i have autism and then when you do the assessments you're finding no they don't is there a high level of negative response um so i would say because of our so by the time someone has gotten to me, if especially an adult, an adult has been through the ringer, right? Yeah. Like most of these adults, it's not like they've been fine all their life and now they're like, hey, maybe I have autism, right? They're obviously yeah. thinking they have this because they've had some kind of struggle in their life. Right. So they, most of the adults I see have struggled long-term with anxiety, with depression, but they found like meds don't help them. They've been in therapy or the therapist says like, oh, this person really has some social skills deficits, right? That are driving this. So I would say because we're more of like a, I don't say specialty clinic, but a little like, we're not a generalist clinic. I would say there's like a lower rate of false positives, but there is still some false positives because uh, a lot of things can mimic other things. So in the case of autism, you can have a history of bad social anxiety. And then if I throw in one other thing with that, like language disorder, you could look very autistic, right? So it's like my job to kind of parse that all apart. But I would say, yeah, I would say the answer to that is yes in some situations, but not as high in our clinic because, you know, I guess that's just because what I'm known for. So people are not going to come for that unless they really think it's going on with them, right? So, yeah. Um, after you assess an individual at any age, at three or, or 15 years old, uh, and then you come to the conclusion that yes, this person has, um, then where do these people go? So you assess, oh great, I, I've got it, but okay, now what, you open the door. Where do they go to, to be treated for the problem they already have? Yeah, so I don't usually just boot people out the door, but I would <laughs> check it out. No, so your answer to your question is, the assessment to me, like uh, a, lot of the, a lot of psychologists will do an assessment because they're interested in what the diagnosis is. But to me, the diagnosis is not a solution, right? A diagnosis is just a label for problems you've been struggling with. So I spend my, the most amount of time on my reports on the recommendations, on like what is the what kind of game plan can I propose to this person to improve the quality of their life? That's like the most important question to me. So I will look through not just the functional test data, but like the questionnaires, the interview notes, and I'll kind of see like what does this person already have in place? What other things do they need in place to be able to flourish? And how can I make that possible for them, whether it be like referrals to community providers that I know or other types of services, like if someone needs equine therapy for, you know, sensory overload or whatever it is. But it's like, uh, so when I, so at the end of the assessment, you know, I don't just mail people reports. Like I spend usually like 60 to 90 minutes either on a video link or phone or in person with them explaining in plain language like here's what i think is going on here's what i don't think is going on here's what i'm not sure of and here is like a game plan that you could try and then the way i run my practice is if anyone ever wants to follow up and keep in touch with me for resources questions i don't charge anything for any of those follow-up calls i don't tell my business partners i do that but that's what i do because i feel like if i'm just gonna be on the phone with someone for five minutes i'm not gonna build it for that stupid so but where do they go to get help though Okay, so the help is kind of fractionated on into like whether someone has insurance or no insurance. As I mentioned, the system is like very busted. So if you don't have insurance, your your 
your, app, your, core, your options are more limited, right? Because they're limited to what's in the public sector. So for example, Horizon and Front Door, they offer a lot of mental health programs in the public sector for people without insurance, or like the hospital sector, right? Uh, but if you have a job that has some kind of insurance, well then there's a wider array of options in terms of therapists you can access or other kinds of services. So I usually will pull on like the resources, like I have a large network of therapists or people that do therapy for different things. So I'll pull on that network. Um, I've just been in the area for a while. So I know a lot, know a lot of the resources or like where to send someone who would be a good fit for this person, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I actually wish there was more services in the, in the public uh, uninsured sector, right? This is the struggle. It's not like the people that have jobs that have like 10,000, like Manulife gives $10,000 in mental health coverage, I think, which is phenomenal. But it's like, you know, the, the family, so the, the more challenging ones are the families that see me through the hospital because they don't have insurance. So then we're having, between the social worker and I, we're having to figure out like what kinds of things are viable that they can actually access. And for them, a lot of it is school-based services. So it's not, it's not a perfect thing. It's not a perfect sign. Like my job is definitely not a perfect science at all, right? But it's like, what can I do to incrementally improve the quality of this person's life? That's my question. So. We would like to thank you for your great presentation. Oh, thank you. And as a sign of gratitude, yeah. uh, Rotary restored the site of one person. Uh, this is the girl. Leo Shimor in India. Oh, awesome. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.